at the table with Jesus, where we are studying the table ministry in the Gospel of Luke. And this is going to be a study of the book of Luke, where we'll go through a scene by scene where Jesus is eating with people in the Gospel. So um, we'll do 10 lessons and we'll follow a weekly format with breaks on certain weeks. And I have the schedule and all the reading assignments on our um, our study page, which will be linked in the notes for this uh, video. And um, yeah, welcome. Let's get started. So we're talking about at the table. So when you think about the table and being at the table, what does that mean to you? How do you think about that? Just in general, like in life. A time of connection with family. Yeah, yeah, you're at the table most with your family and it's a time of connection. What else? It was my mom's favorite thing to have all of us together at the table eating and making a whole bunch of noise. Yeah, together, like without anybody missing, right? That's a feeling of completeness to get to get everyone at the table together. Yeah. What else? At my household, it's a time of no distractions. Okay. Oh. Hey. Sometimes my kids say, like, mom and dad, we should put our phones in a basket, you know, because we all are not supposed to have our phones. But sometimes we're like, what I was just checking. You asked me a yeah. question and I, uh, the answer's on my phone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Trying to, uh, like, have that focus on community and accept that time of community and prioritize it, right? And then, you know, when you have friends over, think about meeting friends for dinner or having friends into your home. Like this is that, that says like, these are my people, right? These are the people that I have. There's a sense of solidarity for eating together, which was, you know, even more formal in the ancient world to eat with someone was to show solidarity with them. But um, we have that too, right? These are the people I accept. They're at my table, right? Well, the table is used as a kind of a, a vision of communing with God throughout scripture. In scripture, it's a major theme. So I want us to think back to the Old Testament and consider um, what, when can you think of you know, dining with God or um, at the, ta the table um, in the Old Testament? We have Exodus. Uh, I mean, there's a whole section on, on bringing sacrifice to God and, and the foods that he's supposed to have. And it's this coming together of God with people in the, in the tabernacle, not the tabernacle, yeah. but the tent. Yeah. Yeah. The tabernacle, the, and, and later if that transfers to the temple and those sacrifices, many of the sacrificial meals of Israel, like if you brought a fellowship offering, you would sacrifice it on the altar and then a portion would go to the priest and the rest would go to the offerer and they would share it with their community. They would eat it, right? It's been offered to God, but then they would take it back and they would eat it with friends and family um, because very often it was a whole animal, right? So it's too much for, you know, just because this guy brought the sacrifice doesn't mean he's going to eat an entire goat, right? Or a young bull or whatever it is. Um, so then it's shared in the community. And so you give it to God then God is, in effect, the host giving it back as that meal is shared with the community. Yeah, so all this, these sacrificial meals of Israel work that way. Great example. What else can you think of? He has been detected in your area. Lightning has been detected. Uh -oh. What about in the garden? Let's go all the way back to the first scene of scripture. Mm -hmm. Where, what do what do they eat in the garden, and how is God the host? 
Yeah, eight of the fruit, three of the fruit of knowledge. Uh, knowledge. Okay, so they're not supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but what tree are they supposed to eat of? All the others. All the others, including the... Isn't there a tree of, tree of life? life? Yeah. Right, the tree of life, right? So this is the tree of life where they would take and eat and live forever. So this is like a food that is somehow conveying God's own type of life, God's eternal life. And so God is the host providing life through the food of this tree in the garden in Eden, right? So from the very beginning of scripture, we get this idea of God hosting, providing life through food. Yeah, what else? Um, there's the covenant that God has with um, my Abraham. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of meals with Abraham, aren't there? When God first makes the covenant with Abraham and the little smoking pot goes walking through the the sacrificial animals, the next thing, God is like offering this covenant. And the next thing is that the sacrifices are cooked and eaten. It's like it seals the covenant. It solidifies or um, uh memorializes the covenant to have this meal. And that is the case with multiple covenant meals. When the angels come to Abram at Mamre, the Oaks of Mamre, which I think you might've also been thinking about, they he says, can I host you? Can I feed you? And there's this, this um, shared meal together. Um, and even when humans have covenants with each other, um, uh, Jacob, uh, makes a covenant with Laban. They've kind of been fighting with each other over Rachel and Leah and the flocks and the herds. And they had all these problems when they decided, like, let's have this be the rule between us. Let's make a covenant. Let's not um, have this conflict between us anymore. They make their covenant. And then it's sealed with a meal that they take together out of the sacrifice to God. So it's, in a way, it's like God is the witness of this covenant. The food is offered to God and, and God hosts the meal between them. Yeah. So it's this idea of, and the festivals, Passover, Pentecost, um, the Feast of Tabernacles, all of those were feasts in that same sense that we talked about, the sacrificial meals of Israel. Yeah. Any others? We've kind of covered the ones I thought of, but, you know, meals come up a lot once we start watching for them. Mm-hmm. You know, they talk about David inviting um, Saul's son to come and eat at his table. Yeah, so um, David and Jonathan are such good friends, right? And then David goes back and finds Jonathan's heir, and it's this Mephibosheth, and brings him in and says, you're going to eat at my table as a sign of my love for Jonathan and my continued um, carrying out of the promises I made Jonathan in friendship. And so, yeah, that is a great example of like, he comes to eat at the king's table and that is um, a way of showing love and kindness. Well, this is like, a vision of God communing with humans, of humans communing together. All, the table means all of that. It's a theme, you know, from that first story of scripture and it keeps going all the way through. And God, we see God is committed to dwelling with people. And the rest of the story of the Bible after, you know, the tree of life is everything is just perfect, right? And then sin comes in, but then in the rest of scripture, God is continuing to pursue dwelling with humans. And um, so when Jesus, God in the flesh, um, comes to dwell with humans, we see Jesus eating with people all the time. It's all the way through the gospels. The gospels repeatedly show Jesus at the table. And each one of these moments contains teaching. Jesus, he never, like, you never see him, like, eating, saying, this was lovely food, thanks so much for having me, and then off he goes, right? That's not the scene of Jesus eating in the Gospels, right? He's always teaching. And so, there, and there's always kind of a, 
a test or a challenge in some way. There's some way each meal shows an insight into the whole gospel message. And um, all of this is kind of a formation that, that adds together, right? And we're going to go through these meals one by one, and there are 10 we're going to look at. The first seven occur during Jesus's ministry. So we begin with tonight's story of the banquet at Levi's house, and we'll go all the way through um, the end of his ministry, seven meals. And then we get the story of the Last Supper, um, which kind of culminates everything that's gone before, right? It's a completion of all of that, which it, um, institutes the Lord's Supper. It's both the Last Supper and it's the Lord's Supper, you know, looking forward, saying in the as you come together in the future, do this in remembrance of me. So it's that that final like pivotal meal, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. And then we'll do two more that are on the road to Emmaus and the disciples at the end of Luke. And so we've got 10, 10 lessons, 10 stories of the table to look at. And each meal is like a pause that challenges, forms, and transforms. And we'll see that in each one of our meals. So because we're doing this all out of Luke, I'm going to do a quick introduction to the Gospel of Luke itself. So if somebody would turn to Luke 1 and read verses 1 through 4, that would be very helpful. You said 1 through 4? Yes. Okay, I'll read it. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time to pass, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theop Theopolis, that you may have a certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Thank you. Okay. So who wrote this gospel? Dr. Luke. Yep. Okay. So we know from church tradition, Luke, and we know, we think of him as the doctor and we'll talk about why in a minute, but notice in this text, who names themselves as the author of this? No name, right? Yeah, no. He's just yeah, writing so, Theophilus. Yeah, he, he names who... The, Theophilus is probably his patron. Right. Um, in the ancient world, uh, I know we've talked about this, so it's... I'm sorry if this is a repeat, but we remember that um, literacy is reading, but writing is a specialized skill that only secretaries had. So um, when you are literate, you can read, but when you need something written, you take it to someone whose profession is writing and they write it for you. So Luke, like all of this had to have been, like there were expenses involved, including secretaries, parchment, time to do the, we're going to talk about how Luke wrote and the interviews that he needed to do, and all of that would have had expenses. And so Theophilus is probably the person who offered to fund this expensive project. We're thinking about Luke Acts. It's two full scrolls. They're both quite long. And so, you know, it would be a substantial project. Theophilus is probably the sponsor. Okay, so we it's technically anonymous in that there's no author named in the actual text, but early unanimous tradition of the church holds that this and Luke are written by, I mean, this Luke and Acts are written by the physician Luke, who was a traveling companion of Paul. And we meet Luke in the New Testament several times. For one thing, as we read Acts, sometimes Acts switches into we. You know, someone has been writing and saying, Paul did this, and they did that, and then so-and-so did this, and then suddenly it will say, we. So I'll read you Acts um, 16, verses 9 through 10. 
A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man in Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, come over to Macedonia to help us. I mean, this is how it's been written all along. But now verse 10, when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So suddenly someone else is on the scene. It's all written, you know, in first person plural, the whoever's writing is there. And we think that's Luke. And Paul mentions Luke at the conclusion of three of his letters saying, um, Luke greets you or Luke, the beloved physician sends his greetings and Luke is with me, but I need more, you know, I need this, these other people and this other stuff, please send them. So that's who we think Luke is. Uh, what do we know about when Luke wrote? Go ahead, Bethany. So Luke is a scribe? No, he would have okay. had to take all of his material to a Dude. secretary to have that done. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. What do we know about how Luke wrote? What was his what was his principles of writing as according to the text here in Luke 1? He's going to do research and talk to all the people that saw things. Yeah, careful investigation. It seems that Luke inv um, interviewed many eyewitnesses as sources. And we have a, Luke is long, right? There's a lot in there. And we think that he walked around and talked to a lot of these people that knew Jesus, walked alongside Jesus, saw were part of these stories, saw these miracles. And in so history, he would In history, we call that a primary source, somebody who saw it or was there. Yes, and so he he was um, diligent about that to go get primary sources, right? He did have another type of source he used. What else? You might have to just know this that might not be in the text. Did he use Mark? A lot of scholars believe yes, and I I think it seems that seems right to me. Um, I think it's the majority opinion that Mark is written first. Mark is thought to be John Mark, who also shows up in Acts, and he was thought to be a disciple of Peter who wrote down Peter's testimony. So Mark may be the Gospel of Peter as captured by Mark, um, and most scholars think Mark is written first. It's the shortest right? It's spare in some ways. Um, Mark, he gets after it. He's got action and it doesn't have, he goes, he's right into the ministry. Um, and so it's thought that Matthew and Luke then used Mark um, as a, as a primary source, as eyewitness account, Mark through Peter, and then um, added to it and expand it, if that makes sense. So we know that he has written sources partly because if you compare Matthew, Mark, and Luke, sometimes they're word for word, and then there'll be a sentence added, changed. And so you know, we get a sense like, oh, if it's word for word and then a sentence is added, then somebody did that on purpose. That wasn't just on chance, right? They wanted to say something more that they knew about this story or bring out something important to them about this story. And so those additions and changes are crucial and we're interested in them. Luke also was careful. He says he's orderly. Does that mean he's chronological? Right, not necessarily. We when we tell stories, we don't always tell them chronologically. Sometimes we tell something that's most relevant first, and then we go back and tell something, another thread of a story separately. And so Luke is not um, bound to be chronological. He puts it in an order that is meaningful. And um, yeah, what is his purpose? Why does Luke write? Verse four. That you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Yeah, he, a, the ancients were not that different than us. If they're going to put all their trust in someone or something, they want to know that it's right. They want to feel confident that the stories we've been told are the real stories, that they were transferred 
accurately from eyewitnesses that this that this is faithful to the real events right people want to know when they're putting their lives on the line that this is for something that's true right and why might they be putting their lives on the line who else besides theophilus is reading this gospel Jews and Gentiles in a Roman government. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the faithful, Jews and Gentiles alike, are living in a pagan society on a, under Roman rule. And so if we think Mark was written first, then that's probably shortly after Peter's death. Peter was thought to be murdered in the mid-60s. And then, you know, give a... Mark gets written, and then a little time later for research, Luke gets written, probably around 70, 80. This is a time when the church is um, living a hard, a hard life. It's hard to be a Christian, right? It's hard to just be a Christian among pagans. And then intermittently through this period, persecution rises in various geographical areas in this time. And so they needed to know that what they were putting their trust in was trustworthy. Yeah. Questions or comments on an introduction to Luke? Okay, let's get into our text. Look at Luke 5. Now, I um, we're in the Levi banquet story tonight, but I had you back up and start at the beginning of chapter 5 because there are three stories here to kind of set the scene that provide the backdrop for the Levi story. So let's talk about each one of them quickly. What is happening in Luke 5, 1 through 11? He's calling um, his disciples. It's the fish story where they had been fishing all night and they hadn't caught anything. And he said, throw your nets on the other side. And then they almost tip the boat over because they caught so much. Caught so much, right? Okay. So before we get to him, so Jesus sends them out. They'd been fishing all night and they didn't catch anything. And then Jesus sends them out again. Before that, something else interesting happened. So let's look at, at verse one. Jesus is standing by a lake, right? And if we read, if we had gone back, I was like, I just, how far back? Can I just back up and back up and back up? So I didn't include chapter four in your reading. But throughout chapter four, we see Jesus has been in the region of Galilee. He's been moving around, teaching and healing people in this region. So he's been a prominent um, you know, teacher during this time. And so people are crowding around him to hear the word of God. And he sees some boats. He's, they're left there by the fishermen because the fishermen have stepped aside to wash their nets, right? We know um, a little later, he says we haven't caught anything, but Right here, we just know like they're washing their nets and Jesus gets into the boat, one of the boats and starts teaching from the boat because the people are crowding around him. All right. Why do you suppose Simon is cool with Jesus taking his boat? Is this Simon's first encounter with Jesus? Probably not. Okay, let's look back. Someone read for us four, chapter 4, verse 38 and 39. Oh, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Okay, so this is not Jesus' first meeting with Simon. He's already done what? Healed his mother-in-law. Healed his mother-in-law, right? So then it becomes a little less surprising that Simon has no objection if Jesus wants to just 
you know, co-opt his boat for a little while, right? He's already met Jesus. He's already seen Jesus's healing power and probably heard him teach because this is what Jesus does. He walks around, he's teaching and he's healing, right? Um, what happens after this catch of fish? At verse eight, how does Peter react? He fell at Jesus' feet and saying, yeah. Depart me for my and my simple man, O oh Lord. Yeah, he fell at his feet. Depart from me, I'm a simple man. What do you think is going on with that? He's recognizing Jesus as Lord, and that's scary. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have like this, this foundation of repentance, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man, that begins this section. This section is going to be, you know, y'all said the first, this story is about Jesus calls his first disciples, right? Well, the end of the section um, in 612 is Jesus goes to his disciples and names the 12 apostles. And so we have like this beginning and ending of Jesus calling his um, chosen apostles, his chosen who, you know, Simon and his companions, Peter, um, Simon Peter and his companions, James and John turn out to be, right? It's kind of brackets the whole section right and then this story of levi levi is one of them too in the middle so it's a whole story about calling disciples but peter begins it by saying i'm sinful it's a it's a foundation of repentance now our original readers right think about those readers in the late first century like they would know peter as who like how, how would they think of peter This brave apostle who was fearless and came to them and, and told them everything. and Yeah, who spoke on Pentecost, right? Peter would be, it was the sermon on Pentecost. He's this rock of the church. He's been um, teaching during this time. He's, this, he's left prison because like the angel escorted him out in the earthquake, right? Has been pro by this time martyred for his faith and so we see this apostle is the rock of the church is exclaiming his own sinfulness it sets an important precedent for everyone um, about the need for repentance and that's you know this that forms a backdrop for this section notice that what peter and his companions do verse 11 so they pulled their boats up on shore left everything and followed him right would that be a common or normal thing to do? Just yeah. left your livelihood. Right? They just walk away from their boats. Hopefully James and John's father's there taking, you know, he's going to take care of them until they get back. It's pretty remarkable. It speaks to a great commitment and probably to a relationship that already has been forming with Jesus as he teaches and heals. Like he must have been a personality that made people able to see that he was worth it, right? Like I don't, he wasn't walking around being neutral. He wasn't walking around being boring or unkind. There was he, that magnetism has like, they've already recognized that he is worth following. Okay, two more stories that form a backdrop. What happens in verse 12 and following? There was a, lep a man with leprosy. Okay, and what and happens said, to the man with leprosy? And he said, if you're willing, I can make you clean. And he said, I'm willing to be cleansed. And immediately yeah. the leprosy left him. 
Right. Jesus cleanses this leper, right? And normally a leper, this man is covered in leprosy, right? Normally a leper was contagious where it contaminated those around him. But what happens here? Jesus's wellness heals the leper, right? So Jesus has brought this healing to this leper. And then what about in 17 through 27? What else happens? His believers lower the paralyzed man. <clears throat> yeah, they, the, their, their faith is strong enough that they're willing to let their friend down through the ceiling. And Jesus does what? First of all, he forgives his sins. Ah, first of all, he forgives his sins. Is that a minor point to those who are listening? No, the Pharisees' heads almost pop off. Yeah, they mm -hmm. they have a problem with it. Why? What do they say? They say it's blasphemous. Right. He doesn't have so, the power to do that. We have a little foundation here of the Pharisees being interested in what's happening, but um, Jesus is rubbing them the wrong way. Like they they have concerns, right? The penalty for blasphemy is death. And here they are saying, this guy is blaspheming. So already we have sort of a, a backdrop of this conflict with the Pharisees. But Jesus says the healing of this man's body, his paralysis is healed. He gets up his mat and he walks. The healing of this man's body is supposed to prove that Jesus can forgive his sins. So that too forms a backdrop for our next conversation. Okay, will someone read uh, verses 29, 27 through 39, please? It's kind of, even though there are multiple sections, it's all one conversation. So let's read it as a group. You can get up. After this, okay. he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so, the, so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good. Thank you. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Levi was a tax collector. The Levites were the priests. Okay, so the name Levi does not indicate that he is a Levite necessarily, okay. but the, and I don't, I don't know if we know, Levi is probably the same as Matthew um, because this is the same call following with followed by a banquet story that we get for the call of Matthew in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's thought that these are the same person, Greek name and Hebrew name. Um, and yet, and so I don't know, I know that, but I don't know if we know the tribe of Levi slash Matthew. Um, I'm not sure about that. I think we can see by the fact that Levi is a tax collector, what would his relationship be with the practice of Jewish faith? Priest or not, right? Like, well, mm -hmm. 
Is he is he one of the practicing Jews? No, he's working for the Romans. Right, he's working for the Romans. Like he wouldn't be, no matter his heritage, he's kind of left, right? He's left that like strict religious practice that we would see from more observant Jews, as we, we would call observant today. I don't think those are terms from that time, but how we would think of it. So this is Levi. Um, what what else do we know about him? We know he's a tax collector. What's he doing? In previous Bible studies, we've talked about the fact that the tax collectors would line their own pockets with extra collections, which is not, uh, that's a frowned upon thing in God's view. Yeah. So he would, have, so the Roman government in an area was in charge of collecting local taxes and sending their portion to Rome. All right. Rome heavily taxed uh, land, goods, food being bought and sold or in, in inheritance, right? They ta all the things, they taxed them. And then a local government also um, collected tolls for people traveling through area. So the Romans would go among the locals and find someone to make a contract with to collect the local taxes. They didn't do that themselves, right? And the tax collectors, um, this is a lucrative job in a way, but they paid an amount in advance. And then they sat at like their customs booth. Like if you've ever been through an area where there's like a stop for customs, right? This was the customs booth. This is the, the toll booth. So he would sit there and collect in order to recoup his amount and then some, as you say, right? Um, so he would they could add an amount of their choosing and roman soldiers enforce their authority so what are regular people going to do about it right the roman soldiers that is behind them and so there wasn't much opportunity to complain so levi would have had a booth on the main road collecting tolls from travelers and duties on goods brought through by farmers and merchants so he is there collecting right that's what he's doing and what do we think what do we think about his financial status what would we guess he's probably doing better than everybody else yeah, he's probably wealthy. And, you know, we see like he's able to give a great banquet. He has a house that's able to host a great banquet. So, you know, we see some wealth. And I think because he's a tax collector, we assume that that's because he's collecting, you know, he's defrauding people. Um, he's collecting more than he has to because he's allowed to keep it. So Jesus sees Levi. Why do you think Jesus goes up to Levi? Why would Jesus do that? He wants to change his heart. He wants to teach him. Yeah. Well, based on the, the idea of Jesus kind of circulating in Galilee and how we saw he's met Simon before when he meets him again, do we think this is Jesus' first time to notice Levi? Or Levi's first time to notice Jesus? Right? They probably... Go ahead. I think it's interesting also, because after that, Jesus answered them, is it not those who are well that need a physician, but those who are sick? I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Okay, so what category does that put Levi in? He's sick. The sinner, right. He's sick, the sinner, right? Who seems to be ready to repent, right? So mm -hmm. it seems like Levi must jesus must have sensed in levi a willingness and he was correct because verse 28 what does levi do leaves drops what he's doing Leave, left everything and followed him the exact same phrasing that we saw with simon peter 
and James and John, right? These mm -hmm. apostles are willing to um, just get, Levi leaves. What what is in front of him when he walks away? People that are going to give him money. Yeah, and the money that people like he literally leaves money on the table, right? Like there's probably a pile of money there that he has collected and he he just walks away into what will be a completely different life right what is he leaving what is he losing his livelihood probably his house the, the support of the soldiers yeah he's despised and if he's not going to collect taxes he doesn't have any backup that's got to be scary Right, this, there has to be a huge financial law loss, and what else? Who are Levi's friends? He's gonna lose everything. I mean, probably his family and his friends are going to think he freaked out and he's joined a cult. Right? Yeah, I don't think um people were more gullible then than they are now right like if you if somebody completely walks away from their life their family and friends don't think how joyous you know <laughs> so yeah so he he probably has a substantial household if he's running a household where he can throw a great banquet he's walking away from them his friends are tax collectors right who's he friends with and now He's not a tax collector. He's going to walk away. So what does he do? He has a party. He has a party. Why? Because even though his family may not be joyous and his friends, he is joyous because he is repentant yeah. and forgiven. Yeah, he has a new life. And it to me, this action of throwing a banquet, inviting all of his tax collector friends and his other friends says... He wants to offer them what he has. He's excited about it, right? The um, We're gonna talk in a later lesson, we'll talk a little bit about the setup that the Greek, a Greek dinner would consist of. The Greek symposium would have a very specific setup, but the guest of honor in, in one of these dinners would normally be someone who was given, and I would like sit to the right of the host, and they were the person that was given a chance to teach or lecture or speak or entertain in some way right so if jesus who's the who's the banquet for says he gave a great banquet for his house okay not for his house but for well it, your our translations may vary i don't know what do you all have for jesus at his house Okay, for Jesus. So the banquet is in Jesus' honor. So Jesus is the one who's going to be teaching at this banquet. He's like, let's give Jesus a chance to speak, right? And it's at Levi's house. So this seems to be like Levi's opportunity to share this good thing that he is excited about. And who are the attendees? So tax collectors, but apparently also Pharisees and some of the disciples. Right. Okay. So it's quite the mixed group, isn't it? He's got the tax collectors and the others in Mark's gospel. He calls Mark calls them sinners. Um, Luke changes it to others, um, and yet later, you know, in Jesus's words, we think, okay, well, maybe sinners is apt. Um, because of the way Jesus talks, but it seems like the disciples are there, and it seems like the Pharisees are at least looking on from very close by, right? Are they at the table? Did they come into Levi's house? Were they so drawn to Jesus that they went all the way into a tax collector's house, or did they stay on the outside and criticize? <laughs> it's kind of seems like maybe they stay on the outside and criticize but well, you know but they have to be there close. they yeah. have to be there because jesus responds to their bickering while he's right now, who do they complain to 
They're kind of just grumbling among each other. Among okay. Themselves. Well, they said to him. Well, the, and they the grumbled to his, of John. his disciples. Yeah. 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 So we saw them grumbling among themselves or even like, um, I think even thinking to themselves in the story of the paralytic let down on the mat. And then here, as we progress to this banquet story, and maybe the banquet was in a courtyard and so they could kind of listen in from close by, but they're, they're close. They're there in some way, right? It says they, they complained to his disciples. And I think of these original readers from the late first century, like, were they getting people complaining to them that they associated with the riffraff, right? Is this how, would they, would they think of this as like in parallel to a story from their own lives, right? And so they complained to the disciples, why is he eating with the riffraff? Why is he with these sinners, right? But who answers? Jesus. Yeah, they complain to the disciples, but there's Jesus and he teaches in his answer. So um, Shirley read that for us already. What do you think this response means? They're trying to trick him. They're trying to trick Jesus. Yeah, they, they think they have a really good point. Right. The Pharisees. Uh, well. Um, yeah, let's pause. Let's talk. Let's talk about who the, the Pharisees sect and what what the Pharisees were. OK, this is a, I'm going out of order, so we'll probably be all messed up. But um, the Pharisees were a, a group that started like in the 160s BC, the time of the Maccabees. So this is so if you were in our Daniel study, this is the time that all of that uh, Maccabean stuff came to fruition. And the Pharisee sect started because they felt that they needed that Israel needed to separate itself from these these evil and corrupting um, influences from within Judaism, right? They wanted to be pure, um, law-following, obedient Israelites. And so their name means separated one. It comes from Nehemiah 10.28, which is a description of the people who were um, ready to follow God purely and separate themselves. So they were separated ones. These are actually, this is a group that's actually quite popular with the people in Jesus's day. They were laymen. They weren't priests. They weren't wealthy. They were common people um, and they were trying their their whole philosophy was that if Jews would clean up their act, then God would send the Messiah. OK, so this is how that logic came about. Right. They said, OK, in the original covenant, God said, obey my covenant and I'll bless you and you'll be stable in the land. If you disobey, I'm sending you problems. You'll go into exile. Well, they disobeyed and God sent them into exile, right? They come back from exile, but they're never that free people. Again, they're just, they're, uh, they have all these overlords, a series of overlords. They're oppressed. And so they're longing for the Messiah, the promised one that God had said he would send to really fix all of these elements of exile that still exist, even though they're back in the land, right? And so they're saying like, if obedience was what God wanted, then let's really, really obey. And then God will send the Messiah. So they're trying to get to the blessing of the Messiah by getting everything right. And they're like, everyone who's not willing to do that, we got to cut them out. They're, they're just sinners. They're an evil influence. We have to, we can't let our nation fall into this constant corruption, right? We got to get it right so we can get the blessing they felt they had to be zealous for the law and root out the faithless from among god's people so how were they thinking of the tax collectors they're gonna bring them down right they're, they're further away 
They're dragging the whole nation away from faithlessness to God. They're traitors to Israel. We got to just cut them out. They can't be any part of us. How are they thinking of all these sinners who are maybe, you know, they're certainly not observant, practicing, um, sacrificing regularly, obeying the law Jews. How are they thinking of the sinners? They shouldn't be associating with them. No, can't afford to have to get rid of all of these elements that are bringing down the purity and obedience that they've got to have. So the Pharisees would not only keep the law, but they had extra laws that they considered that's called the oral law. But they considered an offense around the law, right? We won't ever get to breaking the, the law if we don't break any of this because it's on the outside of the law. It's a fence around the law. Under their logic, what is the problem with what Jesus is doing? Jesus is running across the fence and the laws. <laughs> yeah, he's just he's mowing them down. People with him. He's with the riffraff. These are the people that are bringing down Israel, and he's right there with them, right? It's guy like, this is a disaster. Why are you doing this, right? So, of course, they have a problem. How does Jesus think about it? He's They're the only reason he's there. Mm -hmm. I need to help the people that need helping. Yeah. So this answer, think about this. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So in this like little kind of parable like statement, the tax collectors and sinners are the sick who needs the doctor. They're the sinners that Jesus calls to repentance. Who are the healthy? The Pharisees. The Pharisees question mark? Yeah, maybe. Right, I think it. I think what Jesus says leaves a question hanging in the air for the Pharisees. Do you really want to claim to be people who don't need a doctor? Do you really want to claim to be the righteous ones? Is that what you really want to claim? Right, that's the question. And so, so, so they they change the subject, but they don't really change the subject. What's their next complaint? Um, in verse 33. That they're not fasting. They're eating. And okay, so this is a, go ahead. So they're, they're eating and drinking um, when they should be fasting. Right. When are they eating and drinking? <laughs> right now in front of our faces. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like they're, they're, they're like, they're doing it right now with these sinners, with these undesirable people who are bringing the purity of the whole nation down, right? So it's not really a different complaint. It's really more than this of the same, but the Pharisees would fast because, and they believed in fasting twice a week and they're quite strict about it because they're trying to like get enough righteousness that God will send the Messiah. But you know, it turns out that there wasn't a level of righteousness that they had to get to for God to send the Messiah, right? Instead, here comes the Messiah, and what is the Messiah doing? He's hanging out with all the bad people. Hanging out with the bad people. Now, does he want him to stay in that same behavior? No, he wants to change them. Right, it's repentance, right? He's calling them, he's drawing them into righteousness, right? Not like these are a cancer and I have to cut them out for righteousness, but drawing them into righteousness. And Jesus tells these three um, extra parables, right? Well, really kind of, okay, four parables. So what's, what's the first one? Verse 34. Well, the first one is, can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Essentially, okay. like, here I am. I'm your, I'm your bridegroom. Are you yeah. really going to fast while I'm here? I'm with you. He is, he is in the role the of the bridegroom, right? He is in the role of the host. So Levi's hosting the banquet, but who is the true host? Jesus. 
Jesus, right? Jesus in some way is always the true host of every banquet, right? Because he is, you know, just as God is the host, like the offerer brings the sacrifice and offers it to God and then shares it with their family. So in that way, God is the true host of the, the, the feast. Here, Jesus says, I'm, I'm hosting and this is a joyous time because of this repentance, right? Okay, what's the second one? Verse 36. The sewing parable about new garments, new patches on old garments. Yeah, tearing up right. something new to fix something old when it won't stay fixed. It won't stay fixed because the old fabric is already all stretched out. It's gone as far as it can go. It's just like the wineskin from the third parable. It's already gone as far as it will stretch. And so that question continues to hang in the air. Are you, have you gone as far as you're willing to go? Have you, have, are you stretched out? Are you st stuck in the way, the old way? And then he concludes with that final parable in, you know, it's just a single line in verse 39. Anyone after drinking old wine, what do they want? Desire is new. For he says the old is for No. Right. Who's saying, saying, I don't want the new, the old is better? Yeah. Who's saying that? The Pharisees. I mean, maybe with actual wine, everyone is saying that. But with in the not, parables. Not that. if it's been open. <laughs> okay <laughs> there you go but, maybe that's a good way to think of it right <laughs> yeah nobody wants case, vinegar yeah right in this case he's talking about the pharisees though right the are they going to continue to say we're healthy we want the old way it's all kind of connected right just like the leper like the health goes from Jesus into the sick person, right? Just like the paralytic, the forgiveness goes with the healing. So Jesus says, all of this is connected. What I'm trying to do is bring everyone to righteousness, which equals health and wholeness. Righteousness is not the Pharisees' concept of getting everything right to make God do something next, right? Jesus is drawing them in to health and wholeness, right? And Levi and his some of his friends, it seems, accept it. And so the question for the Pharisees is, what are you going to do, right? The Pharisees' way is to try to build a group that gets it right, and they want to cut out everybody who they think has it wrong so they can get God to act. What is Jesus' way? Right. What did you say, Shirley? Help the sinners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, help the sinners. What did you say, Bethany? Invite everyone in. Include mm -hmm. everyone pull in as many as he can. This is radical inclusion. He's not just including people who are a little bit unsavory. He is including people who are totally ostracized, who are considered traitors to their nation and their faith, probably by themselves as well as by everybody else. And in some real way, they were. They, it was their betrayal was real. Jesus's inclusion is audacious. It's we get so used to these stories. It took me reading this over and over to go like, oh wow, this is crazy. Jesus is doing crazy stuff. He's going to the most ostracized person in the region and saying, "You follow me," and he oh, yeah. does. Right? That's the shocker. Right? We expect it from the religious people. They are there. They're following Jesus around. They may be complaining and whispering in the back, but they're following Jesus around. But these people who you might have said they would have no interest, there they are. 
ready to repent. And this is where Jesus calls us in the church. Can we be as radically inclusive as Jesus? It's a high bar, isn't it? These are, these are unsavory people. They've done wrong things. And here Jesus is saying, no, my way is to draw you in and to help you from your traitorous, betraying ways and into the health, the cleansing, the wholeness, um, the, the, the treatment of doctors, you know, the righteousness doesn't always mean that to us, but when we see how this is framed, that's what righteousness means to Jesus, that health and wholeness. Questions or comments? Well, thank you all for a great discussion. Um, it was very good. We'll do our prayer time, but first I'll um, tell you our reading for next week, um, which will be on the, the study page, um, is Luke 6, 12 through 8, 56. So we're going to be studying um, in, in chapter 7. There's a story of Jesus at the home of Simon the Pharisee. So we're back with another Pharisee story next week. Um, and we'll be doing, we'll look at that whole section and study that table story for next week. So thank you. I'm gonna turn off the recorder. We can do prayer time.